Welcome to Business Talk Sister Rock. I'm Becca. Today's episode topic is how to evaluate buying a business that has buildings and property. And with me today, I have Richard Parker. Thank you so much for being with me. Oh, my pleasure. I'm really thrilled to be here. I am actually super excited about this because you have like a wealth of knowledge on quite a few things. I've been looking over quite a bit of your content and wow, like there's a lot there. And so I'm I'm super excited about that. And I know that maybe, just maybe, if you are kind to me, we might do another podcast sometime in the future as well. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll do my best to be really nice. <laughs> no, no, I meant like nice to me as giving me the time in the future. <laughs> oh, well, that, you know, I'm, I'm always happy to, to have these conversations. So yes, indeed, I will tell you right now, I'm happy to do that. That's an open, it's an open invitation. And I'll also tell you that, you know, I, I get requests for lots of interviews and do do quite a few podcasts. And you're one of the very, very few individuals that read through the amount of materials that we have and to the extent that you did. So I, on that point, I actually really appreciate you for doing that. <laughs> well, I want to make sure it's good. So <laughs> in terms of what I put together for questions. So um, oh, I'm first- sure it will be. Yeah. So the first question I do have for you is what exactly do you do? Great question. So I've been in the world of M&A for 34 years. Okay. uh, M&A. What is that? Mergers, mergers and acquisitions. Okay. It's a very fancy term for buying and selling businesses. And it's actually a bit of a crazy term. It's just stuck for so many years because the reality is the M part is very, um, it's very rare. It's really acquisitions on both sides, buying and selling, but it's just referred to M and A. So I've been in this on all sides from myself personally, buying and selling businesses. I've purchased 13 companies and wow. one additional co-investment. So that, that was an investment with a, with another, uh, with a, uh, another party. And I've worked as a sell side representative, representing business owners, helping them to, uh, market their business, but prepare their business for sale and then eventually market their business for sale and significant amount of work with bu- on the buy side, helping individuals acquire businesses. And, and, and the, the, the last piece of that puzzle is I spent four years working for the uh, Dalio family office, Ray Dalio's family office. Um, on the investment side, we were doing um, investments into uh, funds and operating companies. And I did that. I was hired by the family office to mentor uh, Ray's eldest son on uh, the art of buying businesses. So I, it sounds like I, I've I've done a lot of different things. It's really all within the space of buying and selling businesses. And for me, having the uh, exposure to all the different facets has really just made it infinitely more interesting because I love this uh, sector. Yeah. No, I, I'm so excited about this. Okay, so <laughs> great. 13 businesses. <laughs> That's a lot. Yes. Why did you start doing what you do? Well, if we go back in time, I was living, um, I, I'm in South Florida now, but I grew up in Montreal. And I was working for a company. I was 29 years old. I was making a very good living. This was in 1989, 1990. And I was making $72,000 a year, which was a ridiculous amount of money at that um, age at 29. It was a very fast growing company. They were paying their staff really, really well. We were we were growing too fast in, 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 uh, in retrospect. And so I found myself in a, uh, uh, in a, in a position that at the, originally was probably above my um, skill level, not probably was definitely above my skill level, but I grew into it and had a really re- high level uh, position as executive vice president of their oldest division in consumer products. And the reason why I'm telling you I, that I was making $72,000 a year, it's not to gloat, was the fact that I, in my infinite wisdom, and I'll put those in quotation marks, I decided to invest in the s- stock market on the advice of someone who, with whom I worked. And they were telling me about how you could do this on margin. And I ended up... Um, losing $60,000 pretty much wiped me out. I just had a very little bit of money left. And so I was faced with this challenge. I had my first child on the way. I have four children, one grandchild, and I was faced with a, a monumental financial situation right in front of me. And as I was contemplating, like, how am I going to get out of this mess? was because I knew I couldn't get out of it by simply working for somebody, even if I changed jobs or my salary went up um, significantly, you still have to pay taxes and I still have to live and and being able to 
get back that money was was just going to be a a massive challenge and i was young i didn't want this to be a burden on on myself and my my family and my uh my soon to be uh first child and so mm-hmm. in thinking about how to how do i do this it's either well <laughs> I, I could either buy lotto tickets and i don't or i could either take a shot on you know 17 black in las vegas and i don't gamble and and so i realized that just getting a better paying job and that was really out of the question because i i wasn't going to necessarily get hired at more money from someone else I said my only shot to to do this is to get into my own business where i don't have a ceiling on my income right there's mm. absolutely um no restrictions to, to how much i could make and so i decided that i was going to go into my own business and that was the uh, the genesis if you will for me um, deciding to uh, acquire my first business and go into my first my uh, my first business. Yeah, no, and I actually I'm so glad you talked about that in in such detail because I actually was was reading a little bit about that in your um, how to buy a good business at a great price, and I thought that was really interesting. Like, okay, that was the leap of going into business, um, and and I think that that's a good thing to realize for some people that like you do cap out once you're at a job and this is the X number of dollars you can make in that job. And and that's what they've agreed to with you. There's no really way of getting around it unless you want to become an entrepreneur. And so that that's really, really a a valuable piece of of food for thought anyways. So um, I'm going to get a little bit into how you do what you do. And so, and it specifically in this episode, we're talking a lot about buildings and property because it's part of my building series, by the way, if you are listening and you've heard a couple of them, you should definitely check the whole series out. Some really great content there. But how do you ensure like a business that has assets are, first of all, owned by the business it- itself and not someone else in terms of like the building being built on someone else's property and all that kind of stuff? How do you do due diligence to make sure that? That's um, something that you investigate further. Well, it's actually a very interesting question because this happens frequently well, on the that's problem exactly side. Exactly why I'm asking <laughs> because <laughs> and, and you know and it and people don't realize that. I, and and I, interestingly enough, I was just thinking about this last night because I saw on TV there was a commercial for a, a company that um, protects your title in your home, and my wife runs a large title company in Florida. And we started getting into the conversation and it was very timely for, for this interview in question. But yes, I mean, surprisingly, it happens um, frequent, uh, not frequently, but it does happen. And, and when you think about it in the context of how it could possibly happen, it's surprising that it happens at all. So yes, it's something that someone who's acquiring property, where whether it's part or not part of a uh, business acquisition, has to pay real attention to the diligence that's required to make sure that the person from whom you're allegedly buying it actually has the ownership. Now, the good part about all of this is it can be done through title searches and lien searches, and it's it's a legal procedure. And so what you want to do during this process is you want to make sure that you have competent attorneys that have experience in the real estate component, because that's completely separate than the than the business transaction. And I'm talking about long lines of if you're buying a business inclusive of property. So the... Um, the property portion of the acquisition is completely separate and has to be treated separately, which we can get into in a minute. But through lien searches, title searches, you can determine who owns the property, who is the rightful owner, and of course, making sure that there's no liens against the property because there's two parts of this. One is, you, you're, in your question, said to make sure that the business owns the, um, the business itself owns the property or someone else. Well, it can be someone else who's attached to the business, like the owner of the business or a family member of the business or a partner in the business. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the business that owns the property. It it can in fact be someone else, but you want to make sure that someone else is either attached to the, to the business or is going to hand over clean title to you for that property. And it's not someone else that's completely unrelated, unrelated and not even in the equation. Of, uh, or in the equation, when I say the equation, the mix of the business mm-hmm. purchase that you're looking at. So mm-hmm. yes, it it happens, and you have to do this in a diligent way. But it can be do- it it can it can be done. It's done every day in every transaction. But it it's something that you have to pay attention to. 
Totally. And, and I totally think that that is a huge issue, especially for small family run businesses, because, you know, maybe it starts in your house and then you start building a building on the property, but it's actually on your, on your house property and all that kind of stuff. It's like, okay, well, how is this just because it's on your assets on, on the, like your balance sheet doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually owned by the business. It and could so, happen. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Anyway, so how do you get a market analysis of a business and its property before you make the purchase? What does that normally look like? Is that working with like specifically a business realtor or how does that look? A company that you're considering purchasing has real estate involved. You have to carve out the two entities. I alluded to that earlier, but for the valuation. And I'm glad when you're talking at the beginning of the show, when you're talking about the evaluation of the business, because that the word evaluation is actually a better word than the common one of valuation, because evaluation includes evaluating all the components of the business plus the valuation piece. So when you're looking at a business that has property inclusive in the sale, you have to carve out the two entities and value them separately. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. And we can get into that in, in a minute. And the reason I'll explain to you why. So, but on the, so the, on the two components to that, the property or the, the real property involved with the sale has to be handed over to a professional who values a, a professional um, real estate appraiser, property appraiser, someone who has a uh, uh, experience in that entity because it is rare almost unheard of for a real estate investor to know how to value a business similarly someone who values businesses for a living to know how to value real estate they're two completely mm -hmm. separate entities and they should not be mixed in any way shape or form on the i depending on the size of the business you do not necessarily need a professional valuation and in fact in in, in many cases it's detrimental and we we can talk about that but on the property side you absolutely have to hand over that work to a real estate appraiser okay. and keep it separate and and you keep that whole component separate in the valuation of the business even if it's including property you have to value the two pieces independently of one another mhm mm yeah, no, that totally makes sense because even like if you're looking at somebody's financials and they're making basically um, like essentially they're breaking even, right? But then they have property. So I'm just trying to break this down visually for myself. But when they have property, hey. the property is worth something, right? Like yes. that that's an asset. But then when the business actually isn't making any money and it's breaking even, that really doesn't have a whole lot of value besides maybe it's like goodwill within the community and its branding or something like that, you know, and, and right. I'm sure you have like a more of a, a perspective on that, but just for my, my sake, that's how I would visualize it. <laughs> I know the, the, your visualization is correct because then you have to look and say, okay, so for example, Rebecca, you're looking to buy a business and you're in this exact situation of the example you just provided. You want to buy a business because you either want to replace an income or generate an income, but you're looking at the business to generate your income, right? right. That's your primary um, objective. The mm -hmm. property happens to be really a bonus in all of this, but, but your goal is to generate an income. So in that particular instance, that's not a good business for you to buy. If in fact you have to acquire the property, number one, or number two, even if there was no property involved, that business, if it's not making any money and you're not an expert in that particular field and know how to um, improve that business right. immediately, immediately, not, not over time because it takes a lot of money to improve a business, then that particular business is of no attraction to you and you can't get caught thinking that it may be good. Or you don't want to be caught saying, well, I'll buy the business and this way I have the real estate and that value will grow. And that sounds wonderful, but real estate goes up and real estate goes down. And if you're, you, you look at the, at the business to provide mm -hmm. your income, not the real estate. If you are buying it on a, an, on a passive basis, you may acquire the real estate. That's, that's something else completely. But if your objective is to generate an income then don't confuse, don't commingle the two mm -hmm. because it could be, it could be a, a net negative effect if the business is not making money. Furthermore, if the, you, in this case that you provided, sometimes a business owner, um, will ha who has property will overpay themselves or overpay the rent to build mm. up the equity in the property. And so you want to make sure that maybe the business is profitable because it's in fact overpaying the rent portion 
because they already own the building. That's the way they look to um, to build equity in in property. So it, it really becomes commingled. You have to be very diligent about it. Now, in this case, if that were happening, maybe the business is profitable if you're paying a fair market rent or if the servicing of the debt for the mortgage, if you're going to acquire the property, is less than what the current owner is paying themselves for rent on their own property. You also have the flip side where you get um, businesses where you have an operating business and they own property and they're not paying enough rent for mm-hmm. the property and you're going to incur that as the new owner a new um level of a, rent a higher cost yep a higher yep. cost which you have to factor in because that impacts your value the business isn't, isn't worth as much yeah no totally i'm i'm tracking with you i want to break it down for some <laughs> okay. of my some of my Great. listeners too so in in that case um when say like you have a business that's paying rent to itself commonly businesses are set up where the assets are in a different company and then you pay as a business you pay rent to yourself through to your other business is that kind of what you're talking about there or yes there, yeah mm-hmm. and you bring up a good point which is the assets of the business not all of the assets but property as an example should definitely be put into a separate entity your the machinery the equipment the desks the chairs the computers those are all assets of the business they show up on the business's balance sheet but property should be set up in a separate entity because if the business goes sour you don't want it to you, you don't want it to drag down the take you <laughs> drag down the property with it and so you keep it separate and for another reason for example let's say at some point you want to sell the property but you don't want to sell the business or you want to sell the business and not the property it's just strategically and, and 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 structurally much easier to do that way so for for a whole host of reasons you keep the assets um separated that are really not at assets that are really not assets of the business should be in separate entities yeah. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about, um, and I know this is a little bit different than the property specific, but the context of like other assets such as um, machinery, manufacturing equipment, how do you factor that into the depreciation like of, of what they're currently at a- in the valuation of the business? And and let me just break it down for my listeners because maybe some of them are not familiar, but um, when you purchase an asset, you purchase it, say, for $10,000, and you depreciate that over time. So let's say you choose a depreciation schedule. Five years, you're going to take off um, one divided by five of that value of that asset in the first year. And then from there, it gets lower and lower. But the asset price of selling it sold, or sorry, used, may be um, different or whatever. So when you buy assets that are already owned by the business, they have like factored in what's already depreciated on them and they're worth less than they were new. So how do you evaluate that piece when you're looking at a building? Because maybe it's for manufacturing, you have all this equipment you need if you're going to buy the business. What does that look like when you start considering all these additional pieces of an asset heavy company? Okay. So there's your Um, analysis of that particular situation is spot on. The response to that could get very complicated. And so I'm going to try to keep it as simple as possible. To that extent, when you are acquiring a business and let's, let's put aside the property for a second. We're just talking about the, um, the equipment, machinery, equipment, et cetera, that's required within the operations of the business. The, there's several components to it. When you buy a business and we're talking a small, you know, in the lower um, end of businesses in the, in generally in the market, you're, you're paying a price that's based upon the profit of the business. Meaning if the business makes a hundred thousand dollars, um, and that's, a, there's a formula to arrive at that, which we can certainly discuss. There's a multiple that's attached to that could be two, three, five times, whatever that number is. And that's how you arrive at the, um, the, the valuation of the business. Now that valuation includes everything. It includes all the, um, the customers, all of the equipment, everything that you need to have in place to continue to run the business as it was run before, including inventory. Now, certain items on the balance sheet, a buyer doesn't take, which is the cash and the receivables. And and the way your listeners should look at this is in a smaller business, the seller delivers the business to the buyer the same way a seller of a home delivers it to a buyer, which is free and clear. 
So all the assets come free and clear. They pay off the payables. They keep the receivables and they're delivering them a free and clear business, which includes the assets of the business in order for the new owner to operate the business in the same manner in which the prior owner operated it from day one forward. Now, that's first part. The second part is related to the depreciation. Now, in the United States, the nice thing is even if the fact of those assets have been depreciated by the prior owner, the, for the example, you gave about a $10,000 piece of equipment, you're depreciating it over five years. So every year you're taking a $2,000 depreciation, which you could deduct. And over the course of five years, it gets depreciated down to zero. Now, let's say you were going and buying that business and you were in year three, four, five, or six. Let's, let's use year six to make it an easy example. And the value on the balance sheet is zero, right? Because it's been fully depreciated, but the machinery is working. It's good equipment. And so you're going to be able to continue to use that equipment. The nice thing about it is when you buy a business and structured as an asset sale, as opposed to buying the stock of the company, you could bump up the value of, the, of those assets again and depreciate them all over again. Now, not to $10,000, but they may be worth five, even though the bookkeeping function reduced them to zero, they're not worth zero, they're functioning. So they're worth something. Mm. And so you could depreciate them again. So you get to lower your your tax as a result, which is which is a wonderful thing. And um, as, as a matter of fact, it's, it's, it's a big piece, as, as you read in, in, in my course, it's something we go into in great detail because you have to account for that. So that's the second piece. The third piece is the fact that you need to, if if depre depreciation is added back in the value of the company. So when a, when a, when they calculate how to value a company, when it's when you do your calculation, it's the pre tax income plus the sellers, um, the or the owners' perks and salaries plus the add depreciation and interest because a new owner is not going to incur that. But what happens and what your listeners have to be crazy careful about is when depreciation is added back, when they uh, formulate the um, what we call the owner benefits number, seller, seller's discretionary earnings, upon which a multiple is attached to arrive at the valuation. Well, the depreciation has to be offset by what it's going to cost you as the new owner to replace that equipment. So even though you're getting all this equipment and there is a depreciation uh, uh amount that's attached to it mm -hmm. and hopefully it's not been getting too complicated you still have to put money away for a rainy day as my my mother would say meaning you're getting this equipment and they say well there's we're giving you the value of this equipment and it's twenty thousand dollars you have to add that to your valuation but you may have to replace all of that equipment mm -hmm. over the course of the next four years mm -hmm. and so you have to deduct when, you, when you're doing a valuation, you're looking at the past three years or four years, you have to deduct an amount that you need to set aside to replace that equipment. So there's several components related to the depreciation and the financial piece of this. And it's, you know, when it's laid out in front of some, someone, it, it, it may sound complicated as we're discussing it here now, but it really is, it's math. No, okay, I totally, that's... when you were like talking about like all of the, I'm like, oh, wow, we're getting so dirty right now. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's, it's not over. It's not overwhelming because the, the beauty of this is it's math and there are parameters by which you have to stick to as well, a buyer and as a seller. If not, it just, you, it, it, it gets completely blown out of proportion one way or the other. So it is um, uh, complicated for a first time, uh, uh, listener, if you will, but it's really actually not that complicated well, and that's, because again, it's numbers. Yeah. And that's where I want to come back to Like when I was reading some of your content, I loved this, um, quote you have, I am a firm believer that once someone decides to sell their business, they have already done so. In other words, their focus is no longer fully concentrated on running or building the business. And I think that that's exactly what you're kind of talking about is this aspect of you may actually have, even though they're depreciating it and saying, oh, well, this is the cost of what it's worth. But like if they're done wanting to run the business, they're not concentrating on maintaining things. It could be that they haven't maintained any of the equipment or the building for that matter. Or the, and or the business. 
Y- yeah, totally. And they stopped marketing. They haven't really exactly. answered calls, all that kind of stuff. And you have to think about those things. So in in your experience, does that mean like you have to be specific and intentional about looking at the overall property maintenance as well? And how do you how do you factor that in? Like what what advice do you have on looking for is this business being well maintained? So there's the way I'll answer that because that's a it's it's a great observation. And to the quote that I have, I fundamentally believe that in most cases they've made that mental decision, and so things may slip right to the, some of the uh, items that you you mentioned. And what's really important is when address that question is to understand that you may have property, you may have assets, you may have financials and uh, P and Ls, but understanding that the value of the business goes way beyond the numbers or what the stuff that you can see. And so all of this fits in line with my philosophy as far as when you acquire a business, you're, you're, you're paying for the past, the past financial performance of the business. You're thinking about the present, but you're buying it for the future. And so the numbers, the numbers and the value of the property and the value of the assets those are easy to determine despite the the weedy conversation that we had related to depreciation. I could sh- assure everybody it's pretty easy. Um, and so you look at that, but that that's math and those are numbers and the, those that you can c- arrive, could arrive at. But it's the point that you made that you got to dig deeper. Like what if they've stopped marketing? What if they've didn't hire that additional salesperson that they should have had? What if they didn't replace a, a service vehicle that they should have of they should have um, earlier because they didn't want it included with the sale. And so when you go be, when you look at the valuation of business with or without property, you've got to consider the industry, the competition, the employees, the systems that are in place, the, um, the, the contracts, the customers, will they continue to buy from you? The suppliers, will they continue to supply you? The legal and corporate issues. So the financial piece, the measure, the, um, analysis and valuation of the assets, the determination of the value of a property, the condition of the building, the condition of the assets, those actually are are the easy parts because that's like the scientific part of things. It's the art component where you have to pay attention to equally, if not more, because you need to make a determination, <clears throat> excuse me, that the business is good going forward because that's what you're concerned about. The perf- past performance is, a, is is key, of course, but what is it going to look like when you take it over? All of those pieces, plus the assets that we've, we've talked about, the machinery, the equipment, the property, um, et cetera. So there's, there's a number of buckets here to think about, and that's why I like to divide valuation into art and science, because it's not a science, it's more artistic. But the scientific mm-hmm. piece, the scientific piece is the things that you could really attach a value to. You could see them. So think about this from a standpoint of what you can see is different than what you can't see. And it's equally important to value what you can't see. Well, and and that's where like, I think, so this is another quote that you have that I just think is so important when it comes to buildings, property, like all of that is keep in mind, right, that the seller, the brokers, the banker, the suppliers, and any others that you deal with all want to sell you the business. That's what you have said. And I think that that's so true when it comes down to, if you can take those specific things, the math piece, and you can put it together as, this is what I'm actually coming up with, with the value of this business and being emotionally disconnected from that because everyone else is going to hype you up about it, right? Like, oh, this is such an amazing deal and all this stuff, but like- a hundred percent. Yeah. No, yeah. And and that's why I thought that was such a good quote from you because I'm like, wow, yes, so true. And then being able to take those numbers pieces and say, no, but actually you haven't replaced the roof on your building. It's a 20 year shingle. And here's where we're at in the life cycle. And this is what I'm going to have to budget for in putting a roof replacement on within the next couple of years. And so therefore, this is an asset that's worth less than what you're saying it's worth. And if you can have the numbers piece down, then you can really combat the emotional piece of looking at, okay, where actually am I with the other pieces. Can I improve this? Can I make more money here from what they're doing right now? And and yeah. So anyways, 
that that's what I was gaining from from reading all of your content too. So, <laughs> and it's no, no, it's, and I appreciate you 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 extracting some of those quotes um, because they're they're very apropos to what we're talking about here. And it's critically important that someone who's looking to acquire business as a as layering upon that quote would be the following that I tell people is the asking price doesn't equal the purchase price. And so when I'm looking mm. at acquiring a business mm -hmm. or helping buyers um, acquire business. I don't care what they're asking. I mean, I don't even pay attention to it. Sometimes I just look at it just to see if like they're breathing oxygen from this planet. But other than that, <laughs> so, <laughs> like, so true. <laughs> I pay no attention to it. Zero. Because, you know, if you were going to buy a house in a community that had, you know, uh, I live in Florida, there's a lot of cookie cutter communities. So you can get, you know, you can attach a value to a property outside of some maintenance, for example, roof has to be replaced. But by and large, you can attach some pretty good comps to it. Businesses are not the same. There's no two businesses that can be valued the same. There's no two businesses that are identical. Even if you're talking about franchises, they're similar. No two businesses are identical. And so... When you, the asking price of a business, they may have some rationale. I don't even care what the rationale is. I don't even care if they have hired the best broker in the country to help them establish their asking price. I pay no attention to it whatsoever because the buyer, it's incumbent on the buyer to do their work, to determine what the purchase price should be on that business based upon having a good and meaningful financial return and what it's worth to them. Because what I think a business is worth to me mm -hmm. is different than what you think it's worth to you because what I'm looking to get as benefits from that business. But to the earlier point related to emotion, you need you know, a, a great combination of emotion and logic during this, um, during the whole process, because logic makes sure, you know, logic will make sure you do things in the right manner. Emotion, when I say emotion, it's good to be scared because it'll force you to be diligent. But all the other stakeholders in this, except for people that are on your team, and sometimes even those that are on your team, their agenda is not shared with yours. Make no mistake. The other side of the deal... The reason they call them a seller is because they want to sell you the business. The lenders, the brokers, everyone on the other side of the deal. They're, they're all going to make money if you buy They're all the going to make money, yes. And, and I don't want to paint everybody with that same brush. There are people in the, mm -hmm. you know, and brokers that want to do right by people. The seller wants to see their legacy continue, wants to make sure the right person is buying it. And that's great. And those situations do arise. And you want to have you know, faith and trust in people. But in order to make a good decision, understand that their reasoning for selling is completely misaligned with your reason for buying. You want to buy the right business. By and large, most of the stakeholders that are on the other side, they don't care. They just want to sell you a business. And mm -hmm. so keeping that in place and this, you want to take people's opinion and hear what they have to say because you're, you could, you could extract their hot buttons from hearing what they have to say and what levers they're pushing. And that's great. And that's why you, you sort of cagey in all of this, but and I apologize for the long-winded answer, but to your original point is pay attention to the other side. Understand what their agenda is. It's different from yours. Mm, yeah. Okay. So I feel like we've really covered quite a few things today. Um, and and I know like we kind of got really in the in the details of it. So um I do want to ask, where can people find you? Because I'm I'm sure there's a lot more they could learn. Well, there is. I, I'm doing this for 34 <laughs> years and I still learn and I still learn something in every deal and I'm not that smart. And so that's, that's the beauty of why I love this, this industry because every deal is different. So it's, it's fascinating to me. So the easiest thing is people, um, I have a website called richardparker.com. We have hundreds and hundreds of free articles, free reports related to buying businesses, which people please take advantage of if you want to learn about this process and our course that you alluded to earlier, which you were kind enough to read in great detail. And I appreciate extracting those quotes because you obviously did your homework. So you're a good, <laughs> you're a good pupil. No, it and was I, valuable. I, I was like, wow, this is really good stuff. I got a lot of is, checklists and yeah. <laughs> and that book that we wrote came out of a bad acquisition, the deal that fell apart by my choosing. That's how I ended up deciding to write the, uh, uh, write the material, but, and, and from the website, richardparker.com, they can link to, if they, people are interested in buying the course that's sold on my sister website. And the nice thing I, I went into that, the, the course business never to make money. I mean, it doesn't matter to me if I never sell another course, I've sold over a hundred thousand, which is still shocking to me. But one of the big things, one of the big things we offer is, you know, especially in like if some of the things we've talked about today is I help people, you know, if they, they email me or I get on a call and I never, I never even charge them. I'm just, I just enjoy seeing people get to the finish line and achieve 
what I've been blessed to be able to do because I know how life changing it is. So certainly if, if there's any questions that people have with or without buying the program, it makes no difference to me. I'm, I'm happy to help them. They can go onto the contact us page at richardparker.com and tell, um, just put at the beginning that they want the email or the, the submission sent to me and I'm happy mm -hmm. to uh, respond to them and help them any way I can. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And okay, so then we're going to transition to the gawk portion of this episode. And um, I would like you to tell me about this um, seller that you had that decided he wasn't going to sell the business. <laughs> what what was the deal with that? <laughs> okay, well, it's like I still shake my head at it because, you know, we keep you hear about buyer's remorse, but in this world of um, buying and selling businesses, sellers get remorse as frequently. Yeah, <laughs> it's Yeah, it's I mean, true. they really do. Yeah, because, you know, most of the, what sellers, do, when I work with a seller, or we're going to represent a seller. And I do very little of that now on a very selective basis. But mm -hmm. the biggest question that the first, when, when I meet someone, I know, and I don't do uh, any cold calling. I, I've just been doing this for so long. I, 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 I'm blessed that I can pick and choose if I want to deal with people. And I only deal with people I like and trust. So I handle a few transactions here in a sell site. But the first question I ask people when I meet them is, uh, what are you doing after you sell the business? Hmm. Because good, their purpose, that's a good their purpose is gone. Yeah, their purpose is gone. They haven't thought about it most of the time. Some people have really made up their mind, but most haven't because life is very different afterwards. And so this, the, the story I'm going to tell you is related to seller's remorse. We had a transaction as rep re representing someone. Um, terrific business, been around for many, many years. Solid, stable, bland, boring, unsexy business. This is just the ones I love and, and, and like to acquire. Making lots and lots of money. When I say lots of, lots of money, um, consider this, I'll, I'll talk in the, I, I don't want to identify them exactly, but I'll, I'll call it in the $5 million range. So it's a significant business, mm -hmm. good, good owner. Um, what seemed like a straightforward individual, we got, um, a, a massive valuation because the, um, it was a private equity firm that was going to buy them. And, um, they got a, a, a valuation that was at the, f the far side of incredible. How's that? Right. Okay. Terms, conditions, everything wonderful. The buyer starts to do diligence, has a high-powered attorneys and accountants um, spending money, and the transaction was going to be whereby the the firm that was acquiring the company was going to acquire eighty percent of the business. The owner was going to remain in place as the oh, um, okay. as this as the as the uh, operator because the with twenty percent ownership. Yes, because okay. private equity firms don't operate businesses. They bet on the jockeys, not the horse. So they keep generally keep the the operators in place. Mm -hmm. And um, so in other words, this valuation, which was massive, this company that was acquiring this business was placing all of their chips on this individual. Mm -hmm. That's what they're doing. They're betting on the jockey. They're not betting on the horse right. because they don't operate businesses. So through months and months of conversations and strategies and going back and forth, it could not be more abundantly clear how critical the owner of the business was going to be to the business after the transaction. They were still running the show without question. If they decided you know, to uh, not show up, this investment was by and large in the toilet. Everything's mm -hmm. good. They're spending hundreds, tons of money on due diligence. Everything is good. Yeah. I never, I, I, I never get excited about a transaction until the closes. Like people say to me, congratulations on it, getting an LOI. I say, don't congratulate me till I'm, you know, the deal is done. All the papers and my, are dry. Yep. And, yeah. And my, <laughs> and my fees are in the bank and the check is cleared. Right. Cause until that, so I've learned all of a sudden I got an email one day from the seller that said, um, I'm backing out of the deal. I, I'm very concerned that I'm going to get fired. Now, the first thing I think about is. <laughs> Is this April 1st? Now, I know it's not April Fool's Day because that's one of my four children's birthday. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? Like, I've, I'm, I'm laughing. Like, I'm, 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 I'm not hysterical, but I'm close. So I call him up and I say, do me a favor. Don't, don't joke with me like that, right? Because that's not the way to start my week. And he says, I'm not joking. I said, what? You're not joking? Come on. Now, I, now I still think he's kidding because this is ridiculous. And sure enough, he backed out of the deal because he thought he was going to get fired. Huh. That's just wild. But at the same time, at the same time, I am not surprised because I have heard so many times from from different people that really evaluating a business is actually also evaluating the seller and what they're going to do to you 
after you buy their business, right? Yep. Because it's yep. emotional. It's so emotional. And if you have a fear, oh, that they're going to let you go and you don't know what you're going to do with your life or like any of that, it you do irrational things. Really, well, what happens things. is you, 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 no, absolutely, you ruminate because suddenly selling 100% to the business, you have to think about what am I going to do after? Like, what does life look like? My, my purpose. And for many people, their business is everything, sadly, but it's true. Mm -hmm. And so their, and their legacy and what have you. The other is when you're selling part of the business, you start ruminating about, well, you know, I'm going to, what are they going to do in the business, yeah. the partners? Mm -hmm. do, I, do I have to, do I have to, do I have to write a memo to somebody if I want to buy toilet paper? Like, like what, what, you know, it's like, what does yeah. life look like? But in this particular instance, the buyers went out of their way for months to mm -hmm. court this mm -hmm. individual um, about what, how they operate. And not because they were concerned that they were, the seller was thinking this way. It's just, they want, they want partners in the business. So it was stunning. But to your original point or your question is, yes, it, it, it does happen. It happens um, more frequently when people would believe. And, and I cert and I certainly understand it because mm. when you take, if you're going to do this or sell your business or buy it, you really need to think about this life changes. The combination yeah. of having emotion and logic through this process for both sides of the equation is critical. Yeah. And I, uh, we are out of time today. <laughs> this is probably one of the longest episodes I've ever done. Just is that a good thing or a bad thing? Or did it mean like we got too much into the weeds or we're okay? <laughs> no, it's all good. It's all good. So if you have enjoyed this episode, you should give it a review wherever you are listening. And Richard, thank you so much for being with me today. It's my pleasure. I appreciate all the background that you did, your insight and your questions are terrific. And again, I appreciate you having me.